Hello, everyone. These are the oldest stories, and I'm sure you can already tell that something is a bit off today. My name is Trevor Cully, and normally I host the History of Persia podcast, where I talk about the history of the empires that ruled most of the Near East from around 550 BC onward. You can find that online at historyofpersiapodcast.com or wherever you're listening to this right now. Of course, there's a whole lot of Iron Age between now and when this show would naturally lead into my own. But James is busy with that irritating thing called work, and I wanted to step in and lend a hand. My usual niche is Ancient Iran, which is roughly synonymous with Persia for most of recent history. But of course, there's a lot of history before 550 BCE. I've been trying to think of a vessel for talking about the history of Iran before the First Persian Empire for a while, and I think keeping the oldest stories posting new episodes is a great way to do that. Thematically, this material just fits in here far better than it would in my own feed, so I'm going to be borrowing this one for a couple of weeks. Now, with introductions out of the way, let's go back to the beginning, all the way back to sometime just after writing first appeared in Uruk before 3000 BC. It was a while ago, but this show did a great job of telling the stories of what happened from there and what those people, the Sumerians, thought happened before. But Sumer was not developing in a vacuum. It took a while for everyone to their north and west to catch up on this whole writing and urbanization thing, but to the east it was a very different story. Around the same time that the very earliest written records and cities developed in southern Mesopotamia, a very similar process was playing out on the other side of the mountains and marshes to their east, in a land we know today as Elam. Ilam roughly corresponds to the southwestern portion of modern Iran. If you look at a map of the modern country, it's something like the provinces of Fars and Khuzestan, together with some or all of the provinces that immediately border those two. Geographically, you can think of Ilam as divided into two separate zones. First, there's the lowland plains of modern Khuzestan, crisscrossed by rivers and centered on the ancient city of Susa, which is still inhabited today. To the west you have Mesopotamia, and to the south, the Persian Gulf. To the north and east, Elam became highlands and mountains, and the farming economy of the lowlands gave way to herds of sheep, goat, and cattle. A number of different important Elamite cities appeared in different parts of the highlands over time. If you look it up, you'll probably find that the name Elam comes from the Bible. And while that might technically be true, ancient Hebrew got the name from Akkadian, which got it from Sumerian, where the word was also Elam. The Sumerians took the name from a prominent and powerful early Elamite city called Awan. But the Elamites themselves called their whole land Haltamti. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to keep using Elam. Academic writing and debate about these very earliest stages of Elamite history is highly concerned with defining what exactly constitutes an early Elamite ethnicity or culture, and is always cautious about calling things Elamite if we can't firmly associate it with the Elamite language. I'm not going to do that, both because it's tedious and because it quickly stops being all that important after this episode. Even though they had writing, we can't use Elamite sources to help us answer, really, any of our questions, because the earliest writing system from this region remains undeciphered. It is called Proto-Elamite for convenience, but we really don't even know if its geometric symbols actually record the Elamite language or not. Of course, this could all be changed within a couple of years of recording this episode, too. As I speak, important steps are being taken toward deciphering this language, but none of that is published yet. 
Instead, the early history of Elam is told entirely through sources from the outside world, mostly Sumerian, from the early dynastic period of Sumerian city-states before getting into more and more detailed things beginning with the conquest of Sargon of Akkad. Because of how sparse some of these sources are, this episode is going to blow through the same period as the first 24 episodes of this show in record time. Even if we could read the Proto-Elamite script, it probably wouldn't tell us too much about what was happening in terms of major events. The only part of the language that has been deciphered is the numbers, and everything looks like administrative documents and record keeping, since it's mostly lists of quantities. Quantities of what, we just don't know. This is pretty similar to the earliest pieces of writing in Uruk, and the rest of Sumer, where that designation Nim is applied to quantities of all sorts of things, like flax, pottery, livestock, and enslaved people, to indicate that they were imported from Elam. That's about all we get about the land of Elam itself in the first few centuries after the invention of writing. However, if we look just a little bit later in history, we can see what people were writing about this earlier time period. We have just a little bit more to work with there. The first vague allusions to Elam come from the myths and legends about the earliest kings of Uruk, who had lived at the same time writing was first being invented, and the stories from all the way back in the first two episodes. In the story of Enmerkar's journey to the legendary mountain kingdom of Arada, when Enmerkar is supposed to have invented writing, he actually passes through Elam. When describing the journey of the messenger who inspired the king to invent the written word, the story says, He brought the message up into the Zubi Mountains. He descended it from the Zubi Mountains. Susa and the land of Anshan humbly saluted Inanna like tiny mice. Enmerkar's successor, the fantastic hero Lugolbanda, is also supposed to have made a similar trek to find the Anzu bird. Quote, from the foot of the mountains, through the high mountains, into the flatland, from the edge of Anshan to the top of Anshan, he crossed five, six, seven mountains. The flatland that Lugobanda passed through is probably the Khuzestan Plain in the area immediately on the other side of marshland from Mesopotamia itself. The city of Anshan was located far to the southwest in Fars, and was the southeast metropolis for most of ancient Elamite history. So there we have it, the two most prominent Elamite cities appear in the very earliest myths of ancient Sumer. But in these most ancient myths, the cities of Elam are just a pit stop on the way to legendary Arada, somewhere even further east. But little by little, history started to solidify after these mythical kings. The Sumerian Kings List mentions Elam for the first time in the reign of King Enmerberagesi of Kish one of the semi-legendary kings who is described as having reigned for 900 years. Nevertheless, we know Enmaberagesi was a real historical person whose name appears on several small inscriptions from the city of Kish dated to somewhere between 2900 and 2700 BC. According to the Sumerian king list, Enmaberagesi, who destroyed Elam's weapons, became king. He ruled for 900 years. The archaeology even backs it up. Not the 900 years part, but the Elam part. There's not much from Elam itself at this point, but Enmaberagesi and another early king of Kish left inscriptions in the Diyala region immediately across the border from the Khuzestan Plain. Most early Mesopotamian interactions with Elam mean the lowland area around Susa. This marks the beginning of the trend that will dominate the rest of Mesopotamian and Elamite history. One invades and occupies the other for a bit, they eventually pull back, and a generation or two later the other side crosses the border and attacks. 
More often than not, these were more like raids in force. One side would invade, destroy and pillage a city or two, but other times Mesopotamian and Elamite dynasties ruled each other's land. We see exactly this in the next reference to Elam in the King List. The Elamites disappear from the record during the primacy of other famous semi-legendary kings like Gilgamesh, but reappear suddenly right around the time that the King List starts recording firmer history. Unfortunately, this is also one of the most damaged or missing parts of all copies of the list. Around 2600 BC, the kings of an Elamite city called Awan invaded Mesopotamia. Unlike most travel between Elam and Mesopotamia so far, the Awanites seem to have taken a different route. Thus far, everyone seems to have gone north, through the Zagros Mountains, and then turned south again towards Susa. But Awan was a southeastern Elamite city, and unless they conquered much more territory than any document records, they must have cut across the marshes in the south. The kings of Awan conquered the city of Ur and made it their vassal for three generations, but only parts of two of those kings' names have survived. The Sumerian king list reads, Then Ur was defeated and the kingship was taken to Awan, and Awan blank became king. He ruled for blank years. Blank Lu ruled for blank years. Cool blank ruled for 36 years. Awan conquering Ur coincides with the beginning of one of those first periods of widespread warfare in Sumer. Different Sumerian city-states went back and forth trying to claim important cities and hegemony over Nippur for themselves. It's a story you've heard a few times now. Awan was kicked out of Ur and Mesopotamia in general by a new dynasty from Kish, and everyone went back and forth for a few centuries. There aren't many sources for this period in general, but Elamite kings seem to have been playing for dominance in the same game as their Mesopotamian neighbors. Then, sometime around 2400, we get to King Ianatum of Lagash, and Elam pops right back up again. Ianatum finally pushed the Elamites occupying Mesopotamia back to the eastern side of the Zagros and later in his reign actually invaded and defeated the Elamites in their own territory. These Elamites seem to have allied themselves with the city of Umma, and the vulture Stela, a monument proclaiming his victory over Umma, Ian Nadam recorded, Before Ian Nadam, Elam trembled, and the Elamite he sent back to his land. Kish trembled before him, the king of Akshak he sent back to his land. Ianatum, the ruler of Lagash, the subjugator of many foreign lands, of Nengirsu, Elam, Subartu, and Uru, via the Karp Canal, he defeated. The same stela calls Elam the Awesome Mountain Range, which probably means that these campaigns never pushed too far into Elam proper and never reached the plains of Susa. Instead, they probably just secured Lagash's borders. Of course, Lagash's hegemony inevitably faltered, and it was conquered and defeated by Lugal Zagesi of Uma in the mid-24th century BC. Lugal Zagesi, in turn, briefly created his own Sumerian kingdom before being deposed by his servant Sargon of Akkad. See, I told you we'd blow through a quarter of the show in no time. Of course, Sargon went on a conquering spree and became the ruler of the Akkadian Empire, regarded by many as the first true empire in world history. Right around 2330 BC, his conquests turned to Elam. According to an Elamite king's list found at Susa, Sargon was interrupting a relatively old dynasty that ruled most of Elam from the city of Awan. It doesn't go back far enough to include the Awanite kings who conquered Ur, 
But there are seven kings listed before Luhishan, who was king of Elam according to Sargon. Unfortunately, this list is a bit of a mess. Sargon identifies him as Luhishan, son of Hishiprasini, but the Awan king list swaps them and makes Hishiprasini the successor of Luhishan. Sargon's inscriptions also identify a living Elamite king called Hishiprasini around the same time, and it is entirely possible that we're not actually dealing with the literal meaning of the word son in this case, but some kind of designation about the political relationship between two Elamite monarchs. Both were defeated in battle by Sargon's forces. Sargon's invasion came in stages. First, he took the traditional route into the plains and conquered Susa and the surrounding territories. His second campaign brought him into conflict with an alliance of local kingdoms led by Awan and King Luhishan. Ultimately, they could not hold out against Sargon's military innovations and had to agree to terms of surrender. Despite Sargon's far-reaching conquests, Akkad could not hold all of Elam in its power. Parts of Elam broke off from Akkadian rule soon after Sargon's death. His son Rimush once again campaigned in Elam and pushed as far east as his father, and even defeated some of the same enemy commanders. According to a tablet from Rimush's reign, he even captured an Elamite king called Emasini, who doesn't appear in the Awan kings list. This is probably some other Elamite kingdom somewhere to the east, while Awan seems to have remained in the Akkadian sphere of influence. An Akkadian governor ruled much of Elam from Susa, while parts of the highlands were still possibly ruled by the kings of Awan, independent but subservient to the Akkadians. We know the names of the appointed governors, but not much else, and even that mostly comes from documents they sent back to Mesopotamian cities like Kish and Lagash. Ramush's brother, Manish Tusu, took over next and didn't do much in the east, but he did campaign there once. He seems to have extended direct Akkadian control further into the highlands, reaching into the modern Fars province where he conquered the cities of Ansham and Sherahum before campaigning across the Persian Gulf in modern Oman. Menish Tusu made his newly conquered region into its own province with its own governor, separate from the governor at Susa. This is a good indication that Elam was now firmly entrenched as part of the Akkadian Empire, and no longer a frontier something reflected in the development of Elamite culture and writing around the same time. Most of our evidence for Elam under the Akkadians comes from the area surrounding Susa. That area basically became an extension of Mesopotamia. Where there had only been a few scattered Proto-Elamite inscriptions before, there were now thousands of records being kept on clay tablets. All of these were written in the Akkadian language, and over the course of Akkadian rule, even Elamite names begin to fade out of these records, replaced by Akkadian ones. That doesn't mean that Akkadian people were displacing the local population, as we'll see, but it does mean that local people were using Akkadian names for their prestige value. Just like the names of ordinary people, the names of Elamite gods also become less common after the conquest of Sargon. I'll discuss the Elamite religion a bit more in a later episode when we have more information, but at this point, Mesopotamian deities were receiving temple donations and prayers more often than the native pantheon in records from Susa. But not everything was being fully Akkadianized. While Akkadian language and culture were prospering, the Elamites were still there, and the Elamite language was still developing in this general situation. That's why Elamite cuneiform first appears in the late Akkadian period. The oldest Elamite writing translated so far was actually written using Akkadian cuneiform symbols, 
But within a few centuries, the Elamites would go on to adopt cuneiform to their own language, reassigning some symbols and inventing new ones to better represent their own speech patterns. The first Elamite document written with Akkadian cuneiform appears in the reign of Naram-Sin. It is heavily damaged, but seems to be an agreement between the Akkadian king and an Elamite party whose name has been lost, written in both languages. The Elamite has to declare that, quote, The enemy of Naram-Sin is my enemy. The friend of Naram-Sin is my friend. And also agree to install statues of Naram-Sin in all of Susa's major temples to represent the Akkadian king as a god. There are two basic interpretations to this agreement. On one hand, it may be an agreement between the king and a religious official in Susa. Arguments in favor of this include the fact that it is not presented as an agreement between equals, and there is no royal language used to describe the Elamite signatory. On the other hand, it could be an agreement between Naram-Sin and an Elamite king, possibly Kita, the second to last king of the Awan kings list. The argument for that is more complicated. When Naram-Sin came to power, he was faced with a great revolt that spread all over his empire. Of course, most of our information about those events comes from Mesopotamia, where Naram-Sin beat the odds and reunified his ancestral kingdom. But Naram-Sin also described himself as the conqueror of Elam in several inscriptions. That probably means that Elam revolted too. In that case, this may have been some sort of post-peace treaty for a hard-fought battle in Elam. We don't have any other information about the politics of Elam at this point, but we do know that the king of Awan eventually claimed the title governor of Susa after the Akkadians had lost control. It may be that they were given that title earlier, and it just hasn't been found on any tablets yet. After the death of Naram-Sin, the Akkadian Empire began to collapse around the edges, and Elam is one of the clearest parts of this. Like his predecessors, the new Akkadian king, Sharkhalashari, also defeated the Elamites in battle, but he did so outside of the Mesopotamian city of Akshak, where he was attacked by an Elamite army allied with mountain people called the Zahara, and a possible sign of things to come. This was almost certainly King Kita of Awan attacking the Akkadian Empire. After this, Elam was completely beyond Akkadian control once again. But while Mesopotamia fell into a period of civil strife before ultimately being conquered by the Gutians, Elam entered a renaissance. But that's where we'll leave things for today. It was a slow burn but Elam has finally entered into the historical record, and will innovate new ways to create that record under the last king of Awan. Hopefully, these episodes aren't too much of a break with tradition. Once again, if you want more from me or to skip ahead in Iranian history, you can find the History of Persia podcast on historyofpersiapodcast.com. Thank you for listening.